this morning, um, reading this morning is from the Gospel reading is the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, which is very well known. Um, but Jesus used to explain that we must love our neighbours and that everyone is our neighbour. And Jesus does this by contrasting the actions of two people who would normally be expected to be responsible and caring, and that of someone who the Jews despised. The two respectable people were a priest and a Levite, uh, while well, the one who was despised um, was a Samaritan. One thing, you know, we always just assume, you know, we just accept that, yeah, the Jews hated the Samaritan, but yeah, I just wonder, well, why is that? Um, why do the Jews dislike the Samaritans so much? It's difficult for us to understand because actually they were very similar. They were more or less the same, you know, racially, they were, they were much identical, and a lot of their beliefs and cultures um, were the same, yeah, only very slightly different. Um, I suspect, I mean, can you think of any, any similar you know, relationships between two people? I mean, the one that sprang to my mind is the, the Catholics and the Protestants in Northern Ireland. Um, and Glasgow to a certain extent, particularly during the Troubles, where they really hated each other, despite the fact they had so much in common. Um, and I'm trying to think of, like, maybe the British and the French, I don't know. Um, anybody else? Or Yorkshire's and Lancashire people? <laughs> it could be the German, the, the football teams, women and <laughs> Germany. Yeah, very topical. <laughs> But, yeah, it's so difficult for us to understand, but we just have to accept that, yeah, like the Catholics and the, yeah, and the Germans and the British on football day, yeah, it's, yeah, we just sort of don't like them. Um, I, suppose, I suppose it's true, actually, thinking of Jacob, as well with football, it's the same as they sort of like a Liverpool, United and Everton supporters, maybe, and sort of, if a Liverpool supporter was lying in the ground, having been attacked, the last person he'd expect to see an Everton supporter stopping to help him um, while his mates had, had left him. It makes you think a bit, doesn't it, when you think about it like that. Um, but in a modern retelling, who would, who would the responsible people be like? Well, I mean, the priest, where you think, well, vicar, yes, obviously. And the Levite, well, could be a lawyer, even. Um, somebody like that. Um, who would you think? Who would, who would you think would be a, like a responsible person? I mean, be, could be a teacher, the MP. MP. Well, actually, I'm not sure about that. Should <laughs> 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 be. Tell you a councillor. One of the councillors, that nice lovely councillors, come down to the pantry and, and help us. Um, and what about a despised person today? Who, who do you think? Who would you think? We'd, yeah, if you were lying there on the ground having been attacked and you think, oh no, it's a, and or, or maybe not you, but maybe a lot of the population might think. I mean, one of the first came among a teenager. Mm -hmm. Travellers. Sorry? Travellers. Travellers, yeah. Yeah. Um, and quite a few of those are Christian. Um, and, you know, some, you know, a teenager with a baseball cap on back to front sort of thing, you think, oh. Um, Costume. Just any foreigner. Um, someone from a different faith. I mean, it's, you know, we get these ideas in our head, don't we? We get these ideas in our head about the people that, no, they wouldn't help me, they're different to me. So you can see why this parable at the time would have had a big impact. It would have been really quite something, what, what Jesus was saying. It would have been people think, oh gosh, wow. Um, it would really hit them hard, you know, in a way that a modern retelling doesn't really hit us hard. Um, and it was hit them hard because Jesus was telling them that they had to love those people the same as they loved their same people. They had to love the Samaritans, just as we would have to love the homeless, you know, the roundy teenagers, the travellers, all sorts of people like that. We have to love them as much as we love our own family and friends. It does challenge us, doesn't it, to ask ourselves whether we really do love all people equally, or whether we perhaps are just a bit prejudiced. There's something that will, yeah, something that's worth thinking about that.
Watch. And the young people going out. Well, that too. <laughs> this reading is Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? <coughs> What is written in the law, he replied, and do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. You answered correctly, Jesus replied, Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he, was attacked, when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Second reading is from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfil the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Amen. As we look at this now, um, <clears throat> Jesus used a parable of the Good Samaritan to tell us that we must love all people equally without any kind of prejudice. It's always worth remembering, um, it's always worth reminding ourselves of this, but I think we've all heard this message before, haven't we? I mean, and I'm sure we'll preach on the Good how we go to Mountain, we're not here but other places, I'm sure you've heard it preached on uh, many times before. Um, but while we must never become complacent, um, and I'm sure there's always room for improvement, I think as a church we're actually, we're actually pretty good, aren't we? I think we're welcoming people from all sorts of various backgrounds. Yeah, I think it's something that we're quite good at. 
Um, so this morning, um, we're going to look at the parable in a slightly different way, uh, and then pick up on what Paul wrote in his letter to the Galatians. Um, in the parable, <coughs> so why do you think the priest and the Levite might have failed to stop that? I know, I know it's just a sort of a, a parable that Jesus made up, but just imagine it really happened. Um, why do you think it might have failed to stop? And in all fairness to them, it wasn't just a simple matter. I mean, if we come across somebody in line in the road now, we think, oh gosh, how dreadful. Mobile phone out, 999, you know, phone an ambulance or, or police or both. Uh, maybe administer a bit of first aid until the ambulance turned up, um, which despite some of the scare stories at the moment, hopefully wouldn't be too long. Um, but in those days, they couldn't do that, could they? They couldn't get out their mobile and phone 99. Um, stopping to help someone would, would actually cause a lot of inconvenience. Um, and as we saw from what the Samaritan did, you know, sort of stopped to help him, put him on a horse, took him to a hotel, and then of course the monetary side of it as well, where the Samaritan, you know, you can't just expect the hotel to, to pay for that person, you know, he had to fork out of his own hard-earned cash. Um, so in all fairness to the Levites and Priestly, yeah, well, must have been. Yeah, you can see why they might not have stopped. But nonetheless, a priest and a Levite really should have had compassion, just as we should have, or all of us should have, on the victim. And they really should have stopped. So what might have been the reasons for them not to stop? I think there's potentially three reasons. They were probably busy people. Uh, and hurry to get somewhere, you know, to a meeting or whatever, and didn't want to make themselves late. You know, or, or something really important to go to, or haven't got time to look after that poor man lying beside something, something else to do. Something else to do. Um, they perhaps thought they might look a bit silly helping the man, um, and then perhaps it's a bit beneath them, you know, a priest and a Levite, you know, you know sort of high up standing in society or whatever. You know, oh, I'm not, that's not really my sort of thing I do. Uh, I'll leave that for somebody else. And perhaps they want to part with their hard earned cash, knowing they would have to put their hands in their pocket and, and pay out for that person to be helped, get the help he needed. Just bearing those in mind and looking now at Paul's letter to the Galatians, we see that it warns us about the behaviours and attitudes that cause us to make excuses like that perhaps those that priest and Levite would have had if they'd been real. Galatians 6 verse 3 tells us, If anyone thinks they are something, when they are not, they deceive themselves. In other words, we mustn't think that our time uh, and what we do is more important than somebody else's. We mustn't think, oh, well, we're, we're, we're too important to stop and help that person. None of us are any more important than anybody else. Helping others is not beneath any one of us. If we think otherwise, then, as Paul wrote, we're deceiving ourselves. Verse 4 tells us, each one of us should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. This tells us we mustn't worry about doing something that might look foolish in the eyes of someone else. If we believe we should be helping someone, then we must go ahead and do it, and not be concerned what others might say or think. And think, oh, you know, fancy doing that, you know. Don't stick by scrambling, you know, why do they do that? You know. No, if you think it's right, don't worry about what other people say. Help them. And verse 8 and we'll be coming back to verse 8 quite a lot, by the way. We'll be quite familiar with this by the end of the uh, sermon. Verse 8 tells us, A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. It's harsh words, that, isn't it? Doesn't sort of mince his words, does he? This reminds us that we mustn't aim to please ourselves uh, with the things of this world, e.g. our money. Instead, we should be like the Good Samaritan, who handed over quite a lot of cash to make sure that the victim was cared for. So we've heard that when it comes to helping other people, we mustn't be selfish, 
with our time or money. We mustn't be worried about what people think. Um, the question that remains is, why should we? Why should we help other people? Why should we be prepared to help others when it's inconvenient? It might make us late for things. Um, and others might think we're daft. An easy answer is that it's because Jesus tells us to. It tells us in Luke 10, verse 27, that Jesus says, Love your neighbour as yourself. And when we think what Jesus has done for us, then of course we want to do whatever he tells us to do. But there's an even more compelling reason than that. Do you remember how that passage from Luke 10 started? It started in verse 25 with someone asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a really important question, isn't it? I'm sure, you know, we all want eternal life, don't we? Um, so we really should know the answer to that question. What was the answer Jesus, Jesus gave? Well, the answer included, love your neighbour as yourself. This is echoed in Galatians 6, verse 8. Again, probably we come back to that a lot. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. As we heard just now, we help others when we don't aim to please ourselves, but instead instead aim to please God by obeying him. And when we do that, we reap eternal life and live in the kingdom of heaven forever. What's the alternative to reaping eternal life? Well, we don't like to talk about that, do we? Um, but the Bible clearly tells us that we will reap destruction, our destruction. <clears throat> we perish in the fires of hell which, yeah, really isn't a good thing. So that seems a very compelling case for loving our neighbours, doesn't it? If you want eternal life, then love your neighbours. However, theologically, there's a bit of a problem with that, isn't there? Anybody spotted, spotted that yet? Maybe don't, we're not willing to say. The problem with that logic is that it makes it sound like God rewards loving our neighbours, our good deeds, with eternal life. But we know that this isn't true because as Christians, through what it tells us in the Bible, what we believe in our hearts, we believe that our salvation comes through faith in Jesus and only that. We can't earn our eternal life. It only comes through our faith in Jesus. So how do we explain this, this seeming paradox? Let's look once more at Galatians 6 verse 8, and because actually the answer is in there. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. This means that when we love God and try to do whatever pleases Him, then we will receive eternal life. This is echoed in John 14, verse 23, when Jesus said, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. And in John 15, verse 10, when Jesus tells us, Now remain in my love, and if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. It's all that business about obeying, obeying commands, keeping my commands. So the answer is that loving our neighbours isn't something that we do because we know we should. Loving our neighbours is something that we do naturally in response to God's love for us, prompted by his spirit living in us. Loving our neighbours doesn't result in eternal life. Instead, loving our neighbours and receiving eternal life both come from the same thing, which is us having put our faith in Jesus and inviting him to come and live in us. So, does that make loving our neighbours any less important? No, not at all. 
That's because the love that we have for our neighbours is an indicator of our love for Jesus and our faith in him. Loving our neighbours, we can think of as a symptom of a healthy relationship with Jesus. So, if you don't love your neighbours, then you should be seriously considering whether your relationship with Jesus is as good as it should be. Those are harsh words, but I think it's true. I know it's true. And so this brings us to our final point. Paul warns us in Galatians 6 verse 9, Let us not become weary in doing good for the proper time. Sorry, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Are you feeling weary about loving your neighbours? Are you getting weary in spending your time helping them when, you know, you'll be rather doing something else? Or weary in parting with your money, um, especially in the current cost of living crisis? Or weary in thinking that you might appear foolish for inconveniencing yourself for others and getting a bit weary about thinking about what your friends and might be thinking. If so, then it might mean that you're weary in your relationship with Jesus. In which case, you need to urgently do something about it and restore your relationship with Jesus before you face destruction instead of eternal life. So, how do you restore a relationship with Jesus? Big question. But quite a simple answer. Simply by getting to know him again. Getting to know him better. Simply by spending more time with him. In prayer, talking with him, and reminding yourself what he has done for you by reading the Bible. Immerse yourself once more in Jesus' love, and once more invite him to make his home in you. Set yourself on fire once more with a passion for his name. The trouble is that people can sometimes drift into a state of weariness without really noticing. When this happens, they, they need the help of their friends to make them realise what's happening so that they can do something about it. But I don't know about you, but when you see a friend doing something wrong or having, a, having the wrong attitudes about things and showing that he doesn't love his neighbours, it can be very difficult to say something, can't it? It can be very awkward, you know, we feel that we're judging them, we feel, you know, they might damage their friendship, you know, and, and they'll never speak to us again. You know, it, it's, it's tricky. But remember what Paul wrote in Galatians 6 verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore, restore that person gently. We must let God's Spirit guide us and have the courage uh, to, as Paul wrote, restore that person gently. Remember that if you fail to speak to your friend, well, they may lose that opportunity of eternal life. They may no longer be living in the kingdom of God. As you find courage, your words will help your friend to restore their relationship with Jesus and enjoy that eternal life. But as Paul wrote, speak to them gently and lovingly. Don't be all judgmental. That won't help. <coughs> it comes back to loving our neighbours. Because our neighbours include our friends at church, and our other friends and our family. Therefore, if you love them and want what's best for them, you must do whatever you can to ensure that they have a strong relationship with Jesus and enjoy eternal life. And to be honest, it's one of the reasons we come to church, isn't it? Where we can mutually support each other and spot when things 
aren't as good as perhaps they should be, and help each other to move closer to Jesus. That's one of the reasons that coming to church is so important. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that through our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, you offer us eternal life in your kingdom. Lord, we know that you command us to love our neighbours and want what's best for them. Help us to never become weary of helping others, even when it means spending our time and money and risking others thinking that we're foolish. Well, we know that when we become weary of helping others, it can be a sign that our relationship with you isn't as good as it should be. And Lord, this really is the last thing that we want. So Lord, in a moment of quiet, just show us if our relationship with you has become stale and what we need to do to restore it. Lord, help us to feel your love burning in our hearts now. Lord, we invite you now, whether it's the first time or once again, to come and live in each one of us. Let's come, Lord Jesus, through your Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to notice our friends and family who do things and have attitudes that show that they have drifted away from you. Give us the words we need and the courage to speak to them about this, to bring them back from destruction to eternal life. And Lord, in a moment of quiet, just show us any of our friends and family who we need to speak to. Amen.